from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And during the first half of today's broadcast, we'll visit with K-State's Romulo Lulato as he'll cover a recent study he and other researchers here at K-State conducted on intensive wheat management practices in Kansas. The attempt here to identify trends in management that lead to superior yields. He'll talk in particular about several management factors that appear to be difference makers, including the crop rotation employed, the timing of nitrogen applications, fungicide use, and seeding rates. We'll also hear today from K-State's Charlie Lee this week about the unique traits of the southern flying squirrel, which can be found in parts of Kansas. This and more in today's lineup on Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test fix save a life this message brought to you by the kansas radon program the kansas association of broadcasters and this station you are listening to the k-state radio network and welcome once again to agriculture today well wheat management is center stage during the first part of today's broadcast Across the way is wheat management specialist Romulo Lolato of K-State Research and Extension. And he's along with us today because he and fellow researchers here at K-State have been of late conducting in-depth research into the payoffs to intensive wheat management. And this is a theme, Romulo, that you've been talking up, well, ever since you arrived here at K-State a few years ago. So before we go any further, would you outline what you would define as intensive wheat management? Well, Eric, that's a very good question. And as you mentioned, I've, I've been around now for about uh, three and a half years in Kansas here. And farmers have been around here for at least 100 years or more, many of these family farms. And so when I first got here to K-State... My main thing that I wanted to do is to learn from growers. I wanted to learn what was working uh, in their fields so I could even improve my recommendations to them, right? What is working in their fields? For that, I, I partnered with the Kansas Wheat Commission. They had been conducting this wheat yield contest around Kansas for the last uh, seven or eight years. And so I said, well, okay, if we're going to learn something about managing wheat for high yielding conditions, our field research is very important. But let's see what we can learn from these very progressive growers as well. Right. And in many cases, what intensive management would mean in that scope is like uh, really taking care that your crop is, it has everything that it needs for its full potential. Whenever we talk about yield potential of a crop, we're talking about how far can we push, right? What's the maximum yield that we can take given the best management practice, so optimum sowing date, optimum seeding rate, fertility, and so on. So that's that's almost like a theoretical thing, like how far we can push, because that very rarely is going to be economical to give right. it all that the crop needs, right? But along those lines... It's typically economical to be a good 75% of that potential. There's a lot of research showing that if your maximum is 60 bushel per acre year in, year out, you're probably economical if you are about 50 or so, right, every year or year in, year out. So about 75 or 80% of that maximum is typically where we, we consider economical. So our goal here with this research was to get these seven or eight years of yield contest data around Kansas, we need to remember that these fields, they're typically managed for very high yields and see what we could learn. How is seeding rate affecting yields in these very highly managed fields? How is nitrogen fertility? How is sulfur fertility? And so on, right? So um, that was the goal with this research, is really getting all that data from the last uh, seven years, actually. Uh, We had about 100 fields that were entered in this uh, time frame and learn from them. 
So what you're doing is looking at multiple approaches to wheat management because each of these individuals went about things different ways, some similarities, of course, but there is a a uniqueness to how each yield contest entrant approached their input management, etc. Yes, and this was a learning curve for me. Right, because if we think of agricultural research, the way we typically do is we develop some treatments, right, that we think are going to affect our yields. Uh, we go out in fields and we put research plots. We replicated them four times, uh, put that in several places, and in the end, we're going to have our cause and effect relationships very easily distinguishable, right? So we know that we put that extra nitrogen and that was the response that we got. In this case, you were right on when you're saying that it was actually a very messy data. Each field was management uh, one way. And so we actually had to go about the way we're looking at the data in the inverse, pretty much. We, we had, we used several different statistical methods really to try and learn what was happening there because it wasn't as simple as a cause-effect relationship. So really what we're looking at here are management practices that would be related to yield, but we can't really say that they are causing that yield gain or yield loss. So that's a a way that we're looking at all of these uh, kind of messy data from producer fields, very intensively managed fields. So then, Romulo, what were the primary management practices that you analyzed through this project? Yeah, there, there is quite a list of them, and, and uh, some of them were actually coming up towards the top more consistently, uh, right? So, for example, tillage practice, right? We're typically looking at um, the higher yielding fields were typically conducted under no-till, as opposed to lower yielding fields that were typically under conventional till. Now, again, I cannot say that that's a cause-effect, right? So it's not that no-till is increasing wheat yields, but the adoption of no tillage was higher in higher yielding fields. So probably producers who are conducting their fields in no tillage practice, they are also adopting other practices that affect yield, like crop rotation, which also showed up in our analysis as very important for wheat yields and their fertility program and so on. So, so you see that we cannot say that it's a cause effect. We're just finding things that are more related, right? So no-till was one of the things that came towards the top. We also have crop rotation, right? So the previous crop seemed to be very important. Along those lines, fields that were conducted after soybeans and after wheat were typically lower than fields that were conducted after canola, after corn, or after summer fallow. In other words, we're looking at higher yields in fields that were after canola, fallow, or corn, as opposed to soybean and wheat. And we can argue the reasons for that, right? We're planting after soybeans, we're typically planting late, we're planting into a soil that has been depleted of water and, and mostly of nutrients as well. So the crop will have less time in the fall to tiller. And so there are constraints to that crop that perhaps a field after canola or after fallow doesn't have. And even after corn, because we do we harvest corn earlier than we harvest soybeans. So there's some time for the profile to replenish with water, and we can actually get it into a good sowing date. Uh, we can also argue the reasons for fields after wheat yielding less, and those would be the lack of crop rotation, right? So perhaps even more problems with weed control or even with disease control, like 10 spot, which would be more prevalent in those fields. So crop rotation was also another factor that among these fields showed up towards the top. Another practice that also showed up towards the top was uh, the timing of nitrogen fertilizer. Here, what we did, because we had such a broad range of different timings, we divided in three groups. Fuels that got most of their nitrogen in the fall, fuels that got their nitrogen split between fall and spring, and fuels that got most of their nitrogen in the spring. And really what we saw there is that essentially, if you're concentrating the nitrogen in the fall, these fuels had lower yield than if you're concentrating the nitrogen in the spring. Now, is that merely a matter of access to the nitrogen then? That is, considering the potential for end loss through leaching or denitrification or other loss pathways, if you will? Yeah, I think there are many things uh, happening there. And it's interesting that if you see here, this this kind of reflects the recommendation that K-State has developed over time with small plot research on the field level. Right, we're kind of double checking or confirming those results. But you're, you're you're right. If you're applying all the or most of the nitrogen in the fall, 
several things can happen. The nitrogen will be more exposed to losses, right? Either by leaching or whatever not losses we have, the, the nitrogen will be there for more time, more exposed to losses. Another thing that sometimes we don't think about it as often, but it can induce too much growth, right? Fall applied nitrogen can really create a lot of forage, a lot of biomass, and that can hurt us later if we we had a drought spell, for example. If we have a very dry spring, all that biomass is actually going to hurt us. So really, concentrating the nitrogen in the spring was related to higher yields, probably because the nitrogen can be better used, right? Perhaps a higher use efficiency of that nitrogen. Now, you also concentrated on phosphorus applications here as a main component of nutrient management for wheat. Yeah, so we were actually taking a look at how how was in furrow phosphorus uh, affecting our wheat yields, right? And in these fields, we also saw a pretty good relationship or higher yields in fields that received in furrow phosphorus as opposed to fields that did not. Now, that can be by many reasons as well, right? We know that wheat, among the our major cash crops, wheat is the one that responds the most to phosphorus. What we're looking at is, okay, was phosphorus leading to a higher or at least related to higher yields. And we found that it was. In most of these in many ways that we looked at the data, it was really showing up as one of the factors. Fields receiving in furrow phosphorus with the seed resulting in higher yields than fields that did not. And now just to give a perspective to, to the listener here of what type of yield levels we were talking about, right? Actually, these, these fields entered in the yield contest, they range it anywhere from as low as 30 bushels per acre in a few cases, but as high as 124 bushels per acre. So the average of all these fields were close to 80, 85 bushels per acre, so that the listener has an idea of what type of yield levels we're talking about. Very well. On this Agriculture Today, we're spending time visiting with K-State's Romulo Lodato about an extensive analysis that he and colleagues here at K-State have recently completed. They're attempting to get a firmer handle on the intensive management approaches that lead to greater yield responses in wheat and sustained responses at that. We'll continue looking at their findings after this break. This is Agriculture Today. Agricultural producers, landowners, and creditors, you have a partner in your legal and financial needs. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services offers reliable, trusted information and guidance. Whether you need advice for ag credit concerns or are transitioning your operation to the next owner, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services can assist you in making sound decisions for your business. To learn more, call 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Welcome back to Agriculture Today and our conversation with K-State Wheat Production Specialist Romulo Lolato as we're digging into a new and quite detailed analysis of intensive wheat management that Romulo and colleagues have just recently finished up. Again, to remind you, they have reviewed the practices of producers in Kansas who have topped the state's wheat yield contest in recent years. And in this, attempting to formulate trends in wheat management that could be instructive to all growers. And as we continue looking at this, Romulo, with the proliferation of diseases attacking wheat in recent years, you did, as part of this, seek out further information on the frequency of fungicide use as a routine part of wheat management. Yes, we also looked at uh, fungicide response, right? So... It was kind of uh, very interesting for me to see that even in fields entered in the yield contest, many of the fields didn't have a fungicide application. So I wanted to see what was actually the the effect that we were seeing in those fields. And again, fungicide was another factor that was coming up towards the top in every single way that we looked at the data. Essentially, we were seeing that, yes, there was a new gain from that flag leaf fungicide application, but that yield gain also depended on which variety was planted. So we divided the fields in varieties that were susceptible or resistant to leaf rust and susceptible or resistant to stripe rust. Typically, there was really very minimal effect of fungicide in fields that were planted to resistant varieties, to either disease. And there was a pretty large yield gain 
for fields that were planted to susceptible varieties. And, uh, um, so, again, the interesting thing is nothing new that we didn't know up to now, but it's interesting to see that the research that we do at a plot scale is re being reflected at the field level on these very highly managed fields. Eric DeWolf has years and years of research in this interaction between variety resistance and fungicide. And we are kind of like seeing the same response on the field level. So that's one of the th interesting things that I enjoy about the, this level of research. And if nothing else, that's a very useful confirmation on the payoff to fungicide applications. That is, when the disease pressure warrants them, another variable that you got into with this you sized up variations in plant populations, seeding rates, and what that means to yield potential. Yes, we, we looked at seeding rate as well, right? Because one thing that really called my attention when I first looked at this data is that, on the yield contest data, is that there was a very kind of weak effect of seeding rate on the average yield, but it seemed like lower seeding rates were resulting in slightly higher yields. And part of this, we look at it as well. It seems like if we look at the entire data, on average, we don't see a lot of, the, of that seeding rate effect. But it does seem like when you look at the highest yielding fields, right, those fields that were towards the top, they were not affected by very low seeding rates. So we're looking at population as low as uh, 300 or 400,000 seeds per acre, all the way to about 1.2 million seeds per acre. There was really no effect. And then yields kind of decrease from there. So the, the potential of, or how far we were able to push yields decrease from there. Now, again, we always look at some data like this and we try to understand what might be going on there. So in other words, what's causing or, or what might be causing this cap in the yield potential at very high seeding rates. And I think there might be different reasons here, right? Just like we, we talked before with the nitrogen rate, just very high seeding rates might cause an excessive biomass production. Too many plants out there, competition for water, competition for nutrients, perhaps we're putting a cap in how far we can push um, those yields. On the other hand, if we do have a pretty good moisture availability during the growing season, those very high populations, they can induce more disease, right? We're going to have a, a lush canopy that uh, doesn't allow for air to enter or to circulate very well. And so perhaps we, we might have more disease pressure in those fields and probably they're going to be more prone to lodging as well. So overall, uh, what this research is kind of pointing out is that there's room for lower seeding rates in our wheat production. Now, what's interesting here is that just this month, there was a, another a research that was published out of Mexico. So now we're talking about spring wheat and we're talking about irrigated conditions, right? So it's a kind of a different scenario. But they were trying to see how low could they push populations, right? And it, it was surprising. Their data was actually kind of, I think it, it got everyone by surprise because they were showing, they got 30 years of data. So it's a lot of research that they, they did for the last 30 years. And they were showing that for those conditions or conditions in which you're planting early, extremely high fertility and irrigated conditions, they were reaching their maximum yields at as low as about three plants per square foot, which is extremely low, right? We typically, we want 75 or, or 80 heads per square foot there. So each one of those plants would need to produce 20 tillers each, right? Or 25 tillers each to sustain that. But what they're showing is, is that the wheat plant is so elastic that it, it can do that. Now, of course, we would not recommend that in, in commercial conditions, right? That's just uh, research, and we're trying to better understand the crop because there are a few different reasons there. In a commercial field, we typically need that ground cover. We need to keep the soil there, especially in Kansas with all the wind that we have. So we want more of a population there. And we cannot plant too early either because we need to deal with diseases and wheat streak mosaic and barley yellow dwarf, depending where we are in the state. But I guess the message there is that there is potential, right? There is potential. The wheat plant can handle those conditions very well, and it can produce really, really well. But, of course, we would not recommend that because we need the, the ground cover and, and, and the benefits of planting on the optimal time and not planting early. So you've accumulated a load of information. Where to go with it from here then, Romulo? What do you tell the producer to concentrate on if, in fact, they want to intensify their wheat management? Well, Eric, I think 
we need to do every single step of the process being as careful as we can. I guess that would be my recommendation, right? And it all starts with the variety selection. And it ties back to many of the other decisions. Are you willing to spray a fungicide? If not, you need to start with a variety that, that has a, a good disease package. And then try to get it out in time. So I think overall timing is probably the most important word within crop production. Trying to get it in in a good timing. And I know that a lot of Kansas wheat fields did not get planted in time this year, so we're probably looking at at a lower yield potential, but there was nothing we could do. It was just raining too much in October. But timing of sowing. As far as seeding rate, it seems like, okay, perhaps there is room for lower seeding rates than what we're doing now. Now the question is, that comes with quite a bit of other things like higher fertility. Which one is more economical for you? Is it cutting some cost on seeding rate or, or increasing your and the consequent increase in your fertility rate? Probably for the price that the wheat seed is now, it's probably just cheaper to perhaps go with, with your normal seeding rates, right? So these are all things that we're trying to figure out. The, of course, fertility, you know, it needs to be integrated and you need to know what levels you have so we can take a decision that, that is uh, informed. The, the idea here was not to do one prescription right. fits all, right? The idea here was mostly to see, okay, across all these fields, what has been working, what has not. Now, I want to plug it in here as well uh, that this research that we did was with yield contest fields, very high yield potential, 80 bushels per acre. Now, we have another, a second project that we are doing it right now, actually. Uh, one of my PhD students, Brent Janish, he's out there in the state and sitting down with uh, you producers and interviewing to try to learn more on your own practice. And so we're really looking for producers who are interested in participating. It, it is a painless <laughs> interview. <laughs> Brent typically spends perhaps 20 minutes and um, 25 minutes, and we get all the information that we need. And our goal is to get as many fields as we can. Now, I know that Brent has already more than 400 fields that we have data for, and our goal is that you get at least a thousand, so we can actually have a very good snapshot of not our high yielding guys, but our average wheat producer in Kansas, where we are as far as management practice and yield, and what has been working on our commercial wheat fields. So, if you're interested in participating in that, please reach out to me. We're looking for producers who are interested, and you can find me either uh, in my Twitter account at KSU Wheat. Or my email as well, that's uh, lolato, L-O-L-L-A-T-O, at ksu.edu. Just shoot me an email and tell me that you're interested in participating, and we'll reach out to you whenever it's best for you. So, again, we're intending to increase this interviewing process to get a lot of our representative producers out in the state. And likewise, producers can contact you via social media or via email to inquire further about this research that you've completed. Right? Sure. Yeah. Anything that we talked about here today, I would be glad to share. Uh, we should have a couple of um, K-State publications coming out that I would share in meetings as well, uh, summarizing some of these things that we talked about today. Again, via the social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, both at KSU Wheat. Romulo, we appreciate you going through all of this with us. Many thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much, Eric. And with us on this first half of Agriculture Today, Romulo Lolato, Wheat Production Specialist, K-State Research and Extension. Again, drawing from this rather detailed overview that he and his colleagues at K-State conducted, looking at the management practices that led certain Kansas growers to succeed in the state's wheat yield contest over the past several years, and what can be learned from those experiences. You are listening to Agriculture Today. We'll return shortly with much more here on the K-State Radio Network. Hamburgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about 7 tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants.
Coming to you from the campus of Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you as we move on now to today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. Well, ratcheting back tariffs on Chinese goods to calm the markets and give China an incentive to make more substantial concessions in trade negotiations with the U.S. is now being advocated by Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin. That's according to a report in the Wall Street Journal. The effort, though, is getting pushback, says the report, from U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer. The Treasury Department told the journal that the positions are all at the discussion stage and neither Mnuchin nor Lighthizer have made any recommendations on tariffs or other parts of the negotiations with China, with a spokesperson for the trade representative saying that the agency concurred with the Treasury statement. However, sources indicate that China, too, is discussing the potential of reducing tariffs on imports of U.S. goods. Now, also surfacing in the mix is a Wall Street Journal report that the two sides discussed reopening China's market to U.S. chicken exports. All indications from sources are that the U.S. trade representative and not the Treasury remains the key player in the talks and that Lighthizer has not supported reducing tariffs on China at this stage. Further, contacts say that President Trump will have the final say in what happens relative to the China negotiations, and he has not shown signs of being willing to remove tariffs at this point. Now, this week, the publication The Hill is carrying a letter from a former USDA official who suggests that despite the president's assurances to the Farm Bureau's annual meeting recently that he had their backs on trade, members are beginning to display much unease. This writer is Joseph Glauber, a senior research fellow at the International Food Policy Research Institute and a visiting scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. You'll recall that Glauber was for 30 years a USDA economist and served as chief economist for the department from 2008 to 2014. He was in attendance at the Farm Bureau gathering. Glauber says that withdrawal from the TPP is costing potential benefits of increased trade as TPP competitors such as New Zealand, Australia, and Canada gain favorable access to markets like Japan and Vietnam, markets where U.S. agricultural exporters have built substantial market shares. And Glauber says that after 14 months, months of what appeared to be stressful negotiations, the new NAFTA emerged that ended up looking a lot like the old NAFTA with relatively small changes in the agricultural provisions in his words. He says, however, the benefits from the original and the new NAFTA agreements are currently being compromised by the administration's so-called Section 232 tariffs imposed against exports of steel and aluminum to the U.S. and the retaliatory tariffs that Canada and Mexico are imposing. He thinks those actions likely reduce agricultural exports from the U.S. by as much as $2 billion, more than offsetting any gains associated with the changes embedded in the proposed new agreement. Also, he says, the threat by the administration to withdraw from the new NAFTA if it's not approved by Congress is even more troubling and could cost U.S. farmers almost $9 billion in lost exports. Well, coming your way next on Agriculture Today, this week's edition of Milk Lines, and awaiting with that is K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brook. Mike? Today I'd like to talk to our Kansas dairy farmers about wrapping up 2018. As we uh, finish up the books on 2018, a lot of us will be looking at to see just how our dairy did during the year. And as you evaluate your cost and your income, a lot of times people will do it on a per cow basis. However, I would really encourage you to do it on a hundredweight of milk shipped basis. Not your DHIA records, but the actual hundredweights of milk that you shipped off the farm during 2018. And as you do that, some of the categories that will probably pop out is Areas where we spend a lot of money, one would be feed, another one would likely be labor, another one might be repayment of loans and those sorts of things. And we also might have significant outlays in the area of purchase cattle if we expanded our herd or some other items in terms of equipment and those sorts of things if we did some major things in 2018. And as you work down through there, eventually you'll get down to looking at, well, what was the actual cash flow or what was the income versus the expenses. And again, it's good to calculate that on a per hundred weight basis as well. So as you look at your expenses and income, how did it match up? 
my guess is in many cases there wasn't a margin or maybe the margin was pretty small when we actually looked at it on a cash flow basis. Many of our dairies today probably were operating in negative cash flow. In other words, each month the outflow on expenses is greater than what the income is from the milk check. So what are some things we can do as we move into 2019 to maybe turn that situation around? Well, one of the things I think we need to really keep an eye on is there's really only a couple of ways that we can change this picture. We either have to cut expenses or we have to increase income or we have to do a combination of the two. That's really the only way that we can change that. So when you look at cutting expenses, my guess is in many cases you've already trimmed things as much as you probably can. There may not be a whole lot that you can do to trim that cost more. Well, how about on the income side? Well, there might be some things that you need to check out in terms of milk marketing and income protection for 2019. And with some of the recent changes in the programs, we probably need to be taking a look at that to see if there is some advantage there that might help us in increasing overall milk income on the farm, which may help us when we start thinking about income over feed cost or income over a per hundred weight of milk produced. And there may be some advantages there. But I think we need to probably dig deeper than that on most of our farms. So as you look at income, you need to remember that it's a combination of the milk components produced on your farm as well as the volume of milk. As we think about that, are there things you can do to increase the volume of milk components, which may mean increasing the volume of milk each cow produces, or are there ways to increase the value of that milk? Again, As we look at milk marketing, maybe there's some things that uh, we could do there. Maybe there's some things we can do nutritionally to increase the amount of butter fat or the amount of protein that we're shipping off the farm. And again, that that will help. And keep in mind that as we do these sorts of things, it does change our cost per hundred weight of milk produced. If we can lower expenses slightly and we can increase the amount of milk that we're selling off the farm, that can greatly impact our cost per hundredweight of milk that we actually ship off the farm. So as you move into 2019, I encourage you to pay careful attention to major income areas and also major expense areas to do what you can do to lower expenses but also to increase income at the same time. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension. Good points all, Mac. Many thanks. You're listening to Agriculture Today. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State Research and Extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans and more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. Up for you now in Agriculture Today, our weekly wildlife segment with Charlie Lee, wildlife specialist, K-State Research and Extension, aboard once again. Well, Charlie, information this week on a squirrel species that's not that common in Kansas, but it can be found, the southern flying squirrel, which differs from our common squirrels, right? Yeah, well, certainly the southern flying squirrel is not observed near as frequently as the fox squirrels or gray squirrels that are more commonly seen. Uh, We do have a fair number of southern flying squirrels, but their range is restricted in Kansas, largely to the easternmost row of counties. There have been other scattered reports of southern flying squirrels, including as far west as in Sedgwick County. But they're a species that's nocturnal, perhaps our most nocturnal of all mammals. They're fairly small, not easily observed, and they're a species that does best in old-growth woodland, forested areas. They have um, grayish fur on the upside. When you part the fur, it's almost dark underneath next to the skin. And then a cream color underneath. They have a a flattened tail that they can maneuver quite well, as well as the glide material, the the skin membrane called a patagium uh, that enables them to glide from a high 
area down to the ground, and it's sometimes at a distance as, as much as 150 feet. More frequently, that glide distance is much less than that. Maybe 20 to 30 feet would be much more common. They have a glide angle of maybe 30 to 40 degrees, so it's not like they're gliding for vast distances, but it is kind of unique in the way that they can maneuver. Uh, they've been noted to have 90-degree turns and can avoid branches, lots of obstacles uh, at night when they're trying to glide to a new location. Most of the time, they're gliding from up in a tree down to some place onto the ground where they're going to forage. And you say they, in the wintertime, will actually assemble in comparatively large numbers and are something of a roost? Well, we would call it a communal nesters. Uh, they get in the wintertime. They form a mixed-sex uh, group consisting primarily of adults, although there may be some other unrelated individuals in that group. The most obvious reason for that is thermoregulation. It's been estimated that the the squirrels in those aggregated groups can save 30% more energy by being in that group than those individuals that would be nesting by themselves. Typically, that nesting uh, occurs and reproduction would occur two times during the, the season. Not every individual will have two litters a year, but most will. Uh, they're separated by a couple of months apart and they're going to occur there in the early and then latter part of the spring. What about their diet? What's their preferred consumption? Well, they feed on fruit and nuts from trees such as the red and white oaks, uh, hickory. They store food, particularly acorns, for winter consumption. They also feed on what I would call meat, which that would include insects and carrion, bird eggs, uh, nestlings. Sometimes they'll also eat flowers or mushrooms, things that they're going to find on the ground. So when they're spending that time on the ground, they're pretty susceptible to predators. And those predators are going to include things like snakes and owls and hawks and raccoons. But I think in many locations where flying squirrels have been observed, Domestic cats are certainly uh, very dangerous to these small animals. And that leads us into why we're discussing the southern flying squirrel today. It's in a state of decline. What's at the root of that? Well, we know that the, the species requires forested areas. The exact composition of those forested areas uh, kind of differs between the range. Uh, when you th consider a species that's found as far south as in Florida and then all the way up into the northern part of the uh, northeastern states, those habitat locations have changed over time. Uh, we've noticed fragmentation of these forested ecosystems for more than 200 years. Uh, even though we have pockets of these good forest systems, including in suburban and urban areas. They're fragmented, uh, and they're not a homogenous block of timber. As a consequence, they just don't seem to be suitable for southern flying squirrels. So there's been some research done trying to determine which species of trees, the size of the trees, are uh, most often used by southern flying squirrels. Uh, that research is done at Western Illinois University and basically has shown that uh, they're using live trees about 75% of the time and snags about 25% of the time. Uh, the species there are those that we had already talked about, which are primarily oaks and hickories. That said, is the southern flying squirrel deserving of conservation attention? Well, I think it's certainly wise to consider all species when you're making habitat change. What we're seeing is a decline in southern flying squirrel populations is probably a result of deteriorating habitat due to fragmentation. Until we can build those disjunct areas of forested trees that are preferred by southern flying squirrels to be more of a homogenous block, we're going to probably continue to have a decline. We're going to have to continue to have both a mix of live trees and snags for nesting conditions. And we're also going to have to take some steps, management steps, to reduce predators on 
southern flying squirrels. The primary predator seems to be domestic cats. Uh, we've talked about that many times, but uh, that's certainly one of the reasons we don't have as many southern flying squirrels in these areas of cities where we do have good habitat conditions. We just have a lot of additional predators as well. That considered, folks should appreciate this species and its uniqueness when they can spot them since they are nocturnal, you say. Yeah, it's a species that's not observed very often, uh, has very few negative connotations associated with it, has a unique ability to appear to fly, although it's just gliding. It's something that really should be treasured and appreciated when they are observed in the wild. And that is, once again, the southern flying squirrel. And Charlie, we appreciate the report on it. Charlie Lee, wildlife specialist, K-State Research and Extension. And that is our time for today. As always, we appreciate you listening in. Eric Atkinson here for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.